Hello, Chris. How are you? Hi, Bart. Doing good today. How are you? I'm good. We have a lot to talk about. You've been very busy this week. Uh, you and Jess uh, have been working on Jericho projects, then, correct? Yeah, uh, we've been busy the last two weeks. Uh, we apologize. We wanted to try to get a video out last week, but uh, we were uh, really occupied with stuff. And you know, of course, Fourth of July. Uh, but we've been working on this project Jericho and uh, ramping up, getting ready to do some flight testing. And uh, we uh, had a, a, an event scheduled for over the weekend for all of us pilots to get together. And uh, we couldn't do that. We had a COVID issue. So we had to do some separation of the team. So Jess and I were able to accomplish some flight testing. And I've been doing some stuff uh, throughout the week as well. Yeah, well, um, the Jericho Project, just kind, of a, just kind of a brief background. We'll talk about it in context as we go through. But you want to tell everybody what the Jericho Project is? Sure. Uh, Project Jericho is just the name we've given for our uh, package, our drone package delivery for pandemic response uh, initiative. So it's, you know, we had some interested parties come to us early on when, you know, the COVID stuff was kicking off uh, toward the beginning of the year. And so we've been working this program up for quite some time now and uh, working a lot of the issues, logistics issues, planning, uh, coming up with what we can actually do. It's uh, pivoted uh, to a few different kind of directions. And right now we're at the, mo at the point where we think we have the best approach to come up with something that's very substantial and substantive for the industry as a whole. Yeah, and one of the, one of the really uh, important parts of this, we have some partners that are involved uh, in this as well. The University of Kentucky Center for Rural Health is working with us uh, and we'll be flying and working with them as this moves forward. Um, we're looking at uh, work with the Health Wagon in Wise, Virginia, uh, but we're also working with uh, some of the data that we'll be pulling from this with the FAA. You want to talk a little bit about that too? Absolutely. Um, like I mentioned, we've got a lot of partners, some commercial interests, uh, some nonprofits and universities. And of course, you know, a lot of this is also wanting to get data for the FAA. And so as part of that, we've been trying to figure out the test plans and really what the data that can help the FA. You know, the FA, they're all about, they want the data. Sometimes whenever somebody's working on this package delivery concept, most of companies are private entities. They don't necessarily want to share this data and how they're doing it. So, you know, for proprietary reasons. And so that's where we as a nonprofit, the drone port, you know, that's where we're going to come in from this approach and figure out what is the meat and potatoes of making a package delivery during a pandemic for medical use work. And a lot of the initial interests were for commercial use for that last mile delivery for delivering commercial products to uh, consumers. Um, so as we've seen, there's been lots of uh, research into it. There's been a lot of flight testing over the years, you know, especially once uh, Amazon Prime Air came out with this concept years ago, everybody got accept excited about it, but regulations have been slow uh, because, you know, the, the FAA is really still trying to figure out how they can make this safe to enable a wide, wide scale operation. Uh, another issue with it is cost of economies of, of doing this kind of operation. You know, there's been tests and they've figured out that, you know, doing package delivery with a drone is not quite as economically efficient as our traditional ground methods of delivery, um, you know, postal or, you know, ground transport, uh, and unless we could do it on a great scale. So if we've got a, a local distribution hub that could serve so many people in a, in a certain radius of that distribution center, that makes it easy, to, you know, where you can order a toothbrush and 30 minutes later, it, you know, it's dropped off in your backyard or whatnot. So we haven't reached that point just yet. And we've got a lot of other issues with the FA, uh, UTM traffic management between other drones uh, that are made by other manufacturers, be able to communicate on the same network so they're not hitting each other and manned aircraft. You know, obviously we don't want to be interfering with, you know, each other's, you know, flying op uh, operations. So there's a lot of things that they've been working on. So that's why this process has been slow, uh, slow going. But I, I believe that they're getting to a close point. They're already now also looking into enabling beyond line of sight operations, which will really start to make this an efficient operation. But as far as the medical side, you know, I mentioned the cost inefficiencies on a medical aspect. This is where this is, is key because medical, you know, it's, this is life-saving 
you know, the initiative, rather you're trying to deliver uh, masks or PPE or, or even sanitizing stuff that you can, you know, stay clean. Some people, they can't get out and go to a store. They're, they're you know, compromised and they don't want to take the chance to try to go to a big box store or try to go to a clinic to do a test. Well, they can have this delivered to them in a, in a, in a safe manner and still be able to uh, get what they need. And this uh, especially impacts rural areas. So obviously we're focusing on this in Appalachia in, in the region. This is a aspect that's a challenge that we're really trying to figure out. A lot of the initial package delivery concepts are, are we're focusing on doing it in urban, in urban areas. Yeah, so a lot of what will be gleaned from this will be usable really across the nation in a lot of ways, won't it? Because some of the testing we're doing is systematic and they're with um, drones that are uh, very common. We're trying to do this with uh, things that most people would have, at least people who are involved in this industry, such as the, um, such as the Mavic or the Phantom 4, uh, these type of things. And some of the research that you all have been doing, like I know you all worked this Saturday, uh, you and Jess uh, spent quite a bit of time with uh, weights and all, but trying to define uh, what payload is, and you all have already found some interesting components to that, David. I mean, we talked about your talked about bringing the drone in from the parking lot and what happened to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of these, I mean, we want to create this program to where uh, right now during COVID-19, but obviously in the next you know, pandemic, because, you know, there's always the possibility of a future pandemic. So we want to institute a program that, you know, anybody can take a, a DIY aspect, you know, if they're hobbyists, recreational pilot, and they've got, like Bart mentioned, a Mavic or, you know, a simple drone, but it's commonly available that a lot of people have, they can take it and then they could put on a box or some sort of delivery mechanism that we're, we're, we're working on. We've been prototyping different box structures. You know, if you can go to a local craft store or Walmart and, you know, we, we're, we want to create instructions that anybody can make these things, but also all of the processes, all of the terminology and the lingo so people can understand that that might not necessarily you know be, have an aviation background but these aircrafts you know a lot of the flight aircraft uh, specifications aren't really published and known from the manufacturers you know they so a lot of times people obviously a Mavic you know as an example you know you could probably put two pounds it'll probably lift two pounds I think it's rated for like a kilo but ideally you don't want to put it to that limit you know, so we're trying to figure out where the limits are of what is safe to do a package load to do a delivery in this kind of situation where you're not overstressing the motors or the batteries and they're getting too hot. Like Bart kind of mentioned, alluded to, yesterday I was running a test and I was putting a load on a Phantom 4 and I knew it was like a limit uh, for that Phantom 4 and I did a flight endurance test, put it up, landed, and I went to go pick up the drone and my hand brushed the motor casing and the motor casing scalded me it was so hot you know so that's an, that's an aspect of we don't want to push these systems to a limit to where you're decreasing the lifetime of those motors because there's no real uh, numbers out there figures out there of when to expect motor failure or when how many uses can you get off of a battery it's all subjective of how hard you push and, and you run these systems so we want to create a a methodology that says, okay, if you have a Mavic 2 Pro aircraft or a Mavic Air, you know, uh, what's the realistic limit of a package that you want to be putting on that aircraft and what the flight endurance of that package is. So, you know, if, you're, if you've are if you got a 250 gram package that you're delivering, you can, obviously your, your flight distance is going to be limited because you're working a little bit harder than if you're trying to deliver a 100 gram package, you know, so uh, there's a lot of aspects to this that we're trying to figure out. I mentioned the terminology. There's nothing really established in the industry right now. So companies are working on this, this delivery aspect, but the medical side, you know, hospitals, healthcare networks, that's their background. It's healthcare and it's not really aviation. It's not really safety. So we're trying to create this program and establish these, these best practices really. Um, to, to enable them to pick up that program and establish it pretty rapidly in the next pandemic event. Or even to just do this as a regular operation. If they're wanting to do, say it's a uh, pharmacy, 
and they want to start delivering met, uh, their prescription meds to all their patients within a certain radius. So obviously we're starting with uh, visual line of sight operations for part 107 commercial, and then we'll eventually, we're taking baby steps, we'll eventually move into what you need to do to enable beyond line of sight operations. Yeah, and you mentioned something just a second ago that was really important too. This we're you and I are used to working on the aviation side of, of things. We've been you've been doing this for a long time. I've been in this for about four years, and we I understand a lot of the terminology that's used in the aviation area, but I understand very little of the medical terminology. Um, so this makes it a beautiful thing with uh, working with these uh, medical organizations because they're going to be able to be with us and verify when the use of drones is really needed uh, instead of, you know, it, there's going to be times it would be better for, uh, you know, for a person to deliver a package and put the food on their porch from the grocery store than it would be to use a drone to do that. I mean, it's obviously this is not the answer to everything but maybe you have someone who doesn't have a family member that lives close, maybe they're elderly, maybe they're at risk. Um, this may be a potential to help them out. Um, it could be something as simple as taking uh, money to them. It could be, as you said, PPE, hand sanitizer. It could be something small, but it could be something beneficial. It could even be the mail. Uh, for instance, these people may not have the opportunity to walk down the hill. We live in the mountains down to the mailbox and get the mail. They may be 75 years old and have some issues. So this may be an opportunity to do things in a visual line of sight thing that's very optimal. Um, so what we're gonna do is find out what the, we, we have an idea of what some of the uh, issues will be, but also some of the potential, but we'll learn from that side of the fence what is really, uh, beneficial so we'll be able to look and say you know this is a very good option in this realm but maybe not so much here uh, the other thing that you mentioned just a little bit about Chris but, but we've not talked about in depth and you may want to tell them a little bit more about this is uh, what the company USGT will be doing with the visual observer uh, certificate and why that's important too and how that involves the FAA you want to tell them a little bit about that yeah absolutely so uh, I'll back up just a tiny bit here. You know, uh, at the start of COVID, there was a lot of interest in this and, and a lot of parties, not just us at the drill port. So some universities, some government entities have ran uh, some flight tests and done some initial testing. And yes, obviously we've proved this out as a concept. It works doing this package delivery. You know, so that's what the drone port, we wanna move this and uh, do this beyond just showing off and yeah, hey, we could do this, you know, great. We want to actually make this work, you know, so there's a lot of things that we need to build, building blocks into this to make it successful. And part of this is the training, you know, as Bart mentioned, you know, medical side, they don't know much about the aviation. So we need to figure out what these best practices are and come up with this training. So as part of that, we're looking at uh, what the pilots, you know, training wise from a layman, that's a, a recreational pilot to an expert pilot or a commercial entity that wants to take their aircraft especially designed for doing package delivery and integrate that with a medical delivery process. But uh, so even to the visual observers that are part of the flight crew or the recipients, you know, the recipient could be a, a third person that's part of the crew that are trained either in just even simply, especially in older demographics, how to expect a delivery to occur. If it's a new technology for them, sometimes it, the adoption rate for them can be a little slow, you know, even down to how they can even order something through an app on a phone, on a smart device, and how the communication method of notifying them that, you know, the package will be delivered tomorrow and then at such and such time, be ready. And what type of things that anybody can commonly have at their house or easily get that could be used as ground markers for the delivery team. You know, so we're even looking at stuff like that that would enable a pilot to know you know, even if there's a, a recipient there, if we've got uh, body language or hand signals that we can train and teach these people to utilize to be able to communicate with the pilot, if they, as a backup, or, or if they don't necessarily need to be on cell call with them or using walkie talkies radios. So we're looking at a lot of these different methodologies to create this training to where these layman people can understand and actually uh, either be part of the flight crew 
on the medical side, you know, if it's a nurse or a home practitioner that's there to receive uh, the, the medicine delivery or uh, any type of medical device that they need to for that patient and then hand, you know, uh, provide that to the patient at that point. Or if it's the, the end recipient, it could be a patient in a medical aspect or a normal person, you know, this isn't just medical. You know, if somebody can't go to the grocery store or goes, you know, somewhere to a box store and get something, they don't wanna necessarily do that. Uh, you know, this is a commercially viable way uh, for, for businesses to do things where they can deliver people to, or deliver stuff to people and people can know how to effectively do this. And so there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot built into it. So Bart mentioned the visual observer training. There's also a recipient part of this that we're building into uh, to enable recipients, if they're gonna be part of the flight crew, how they interact with doing this successfully and safely. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it's a really important aspect of it too. And like, you know, like you were saying, even though somebody might not be a pilot, maybe they're a family member, uh, maybe they're a community member, somebody that would be able to be there to help guide uh, with somebody who's working with the individual line of sight. But another thing that this uh, helps with is the FAA, if we're able to use uh, visual observers, then that could extend our visual line of sight reach as well. So that with this testing and with the training, uh, that helps us prepare for additional beyond visual line of sight potentially. That's what our hope is at some point in time to be able to escalate into that uh, area. So uh, Chris, with the training, uh, with, with this uh, project we're in, uh, we have uh, sponsorships that are available We've, with our webinars and the things that also help out within uh, within the Project Jericho. You want to tell them a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, like I mentioned, we're a nonprofit. So uh, what we're doing, we're trying to do this for the community, for the industry, you know, to be able to do this uh, package uh, or, or do this in a pandemic response. And so any, any sponsorship, any donations, you know, can help us, whether it's directly toward this Jericho project, because uh, obviously right now we're starting at this, it's going to be an ongoing, you know, long-term project. But uh, as Bart mentioned, we've got other things. We've got uh, an ongoing webinar series that we're doing uh, educational videos uh, for a lot of it's most, a lot of it's uh, geared toward public agencies, first responders, and commercial interests. Um, but it's it's really education for everybody in the field, and that's that's an ongoing part of it. And then we've also got our annual conference. So we've you know we had one scheduled this year. COVID kind of uh, interrupted that. So we're pushing most of the scheduled sessions and content into next year, uh, next spring. And so hopefully we can do that. And, uh, you know, we're always going to be uh, looking for sponsorships or, or donation, you know, to help us with this, uh, keep our cause going. And, you know, we've been very busy over the summer. You know, we, we said, you know, we were going to try to do a weekly video and we couldn't get one out last week. We've been working a lot with uh, the, the uh, design team for the indoor flight facility that we've got funding for that we mentioned in our previous video. So sometimes, you know, we've got a lot of different uh, things that we're working on and we, try, we, don't have, we don't have enough time to really get all this good information out to you guys. So we're trying this format to try to get, keep you guys updated. And, uh, you know, we're obviously, um, we want to build this as a community. So you, you want to volunteer. If you're a company and you want to volunteer, you got drone systems that you're working on and you'd like to be part of this concept you know, or you've got data on your, your, your aircraft that you can share for us, motor performance, specs, lift weight, um, that kind of information, that's, that's very helpful. If you're an individual as a hobbyist or a, a commercial pilot, you know, we can always use the help rather, because we're looking at things of like the terminology, you know, what's the best terminology for us to adopt as a standard across the board for everybody and as part of this process. A lot of us, we come from different backgrounds. Some of us are from first responders. Some of us are from the military, like myself. You know, some of us are from general aviation. Some of us don't really have a lot of the aviation aspects. So we want to come at this from all angles of experience and say, okay, this, is, this might be better terminology to use over this kind of terminology. So it's very specific or pigeonholed for one type of you know, traditional use. And we need to make it to where it can be easily trained and understand Understandable uh, from layman aspect as well. Yeah, well said. I think that generally covers a lot of what's going on with the uh, Jericho project. There's a, it's an ongoing process. We had hoped that this would be something that would be 
uh, really quick. What ended up happening, as Chris mentioned earlier, this has morphed quite a lot and inevitably has become better because we're in an area that has not been researched at all, really, that we're aware of. And this is an opportunity for us to hopefully provide back to the community in, in a good, positive way, information, good, safe uh, communication efforts and flight abilities and working with the FAA and also with the medical community. And I think it's going to expand beyond that as this moves forward. Um, and I think that's really good. So the, the ability for us to do research methodology with a well-known university like the University of Kentucky is a really good opportunity for us. Um, and the Health Wagon in Wise, Virginia is another really good opportunity. They were actually the first ones that had a package delivered by a drone in the United States uh, with Flirty, who is in the Smithsonian Institute. So they have been an advocate of this for quite a long time. And that's, that's another reason that they're a very good partner in this and we're looking forward to working with them. So um, Chris, do you have any final words? Uh, just uh, look, look forward to future updates. And if you'd like to know more or you'd like to volunteer, please you know, uh, get with Bart or myself. We're, we're easily findable either on LinkedIn, social media, or you know, email off the Droneport website. We don't necessarily update the website as often as we'd like to, but we try to at least get updates out on our YouTube channel and you know, Facebook and LinkedIn pages. So please yeah. subscribe and, and follow us on those places. Uh, we are gonna create a, a group on Facebook. So anybody that wants to be involved in Project Jericho can be a part of that group and we can communicate a little bit easier you know, obviously we're working on this uh, locally with partners, but this is a nationwide and even an international concept. So you could be anywhere in the world. You don't have to be just from this area because that's what we're making this to be able to work anywhere, not just in rural Appalachia. And we want, we want to create a program that works for everybody during a pandemic response. Yeah, and as Chris said, um, if, you, uh, if you'll uh, follow us on uh, Facebook and YouTube, uh, you can keep up with what's going on with the drone port. It's not the same information each week. If we were able to get it out each week, we have a lot going on with the drone port. But the Jericho project is very important. Um, it's it's something we're uh, we're committed and dedicated to doing. So, Chris, thanks for all your uh, information. Thanks for your help, and I'll see you on the flip side next week. All right. Yeah, me, Bart. I'll all see right. You. See, you, Chris.